I'm Aria Schwartz, and welcome to the Windsider Show, where it's all about the W. As we broke earlier this week, the WNBA draft lottery took place today, December 4th, at the halftime of the NCAA game of Louisville and DePaul. I'm joined by B. Terrell to break it down. If you like our show, please consider joining our Patreon community, patreon.com backslash Winsider. For less than a cup of coffee a month, you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the W. And don't forget to see our staff's amazing written content over at winsider.com. That's winsider.com. And while you're there, make sure to check out the Overseas Tracker. It's live now, and you can track where your favorite WNBA players are playing overseas all in one place, broken down by their WNBA teams. B, I'm excited to have you on the show. Uh, I know the fans are are big fans of your uh, your mock drafts. How you feeling now that the lottery has been announced? We know where the teams are drafting, so now we can actually work on a mock draft, kind of. Yeah, that's the fun part. Um, I'm excited. Um, it's finally live. That's where everyone can start kind of twiddling their fingers and say, okay, who's going to go here? I think it's like that imaginary GM cap, and let's start mm-hmm. assessing what each team will need. Totally. And and I think the interesting aspect, which adds a completely different level that we have not seen in a very long time, is the NCAA has announced, correct me if I'm wrong, but another year of eligibility for players because of the pandemic and what's going on around this season. So I think, you know, typically going into this at this part of the season, we we're talking about players who might declare early. They might have another year of eligibility, but be eligible to declare for the WNBA draft. Will they, will they not? But now We have to add to that equation of will this player decide that they want to play one more year in the college game? That's going to throw a huge clog into it, a huge wrench into the clog, whatever the phrase is. I like getting my phrases wrong. Real quick, let's break down what the number or what the order is for the 2021 draft. The New York Liberty get the number one draft pick for the second year in a row. The Dallas Wings have the number two pick. The Atlanta Dream, number three. Indiana Fever, four. Dallas Wings again on the board with the number five pick, the Mercury with the six pick, the Wings back on it at seven, the Sky at eight, Minnesota Lynx at nine, LA Sparks at 10, Seattle Storm at 11, and Las Vegas Aces at 12. And at this point, I'm going to remind you to subscribe to the Winsider.com, the Winsider Network. And please do not forget to hit subscribe on the podcast called The Floor Game presented by Winsider with Ben Dole. It's some great, great stuff. Uh, and you know, I, I love talking about WNBA stuff. I'm always blowing up Ben's phone. So the least I can do is give him a shout out on the pod. Uh, cause I'm always asking him questions about college game. I think you and Ben are kind, you, Ben and Rachel are kind of the people that I'm hitting up like, Hey, what's going on? Explain this to me. Cause the NCAA game is a little bit above my head. I'm not going to lie about that. Let's get into this and, <laughs> and break it down. What we're going to do in this show is talk about the four lottery teams and, what we think these teams need and can build on through the draft. And and sometimes, you know what, it's not even going to be through the draft that they build and that they grow and get better. I know people don't want to hear that on draft night or on draft lottery night, but that's how we're going to do it. So starting with the Liberty, let me give you a couple of my thoughts on it and, and we'll go back and forth on this beep. For me, the Liberty, it, it's pretty plain and simple. It's bigs. That's what they need. They need a big who can play the modern ball. We saw it this past season with their rookie squad, as, as I like to refer to them. Um, they, they tried to instill that modern philosophy for their bigs, where they were encouraging their bigs, shoot the three, shoot the three, three, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. This team is so guard heavy. They have Asia Durr from, from draft two years ago. They got Sabrina from last year's draft. We didn't get to see them play together due to injuries. I'm excited to see what happens there. Then you have Kia Nurse also. So we're talking about a team that's very guard heavy. And I won't get into Asia, but, you know, this team is very guard heavy. So if you're asking me what they need, you got to be looking at the bigs. What do you think this Liberty team is looking to do uh, in this draft? And I should, for the fans, as Ben has pointed out, and if you have pointed out to me, keep in mind this draft is much more perimeter heavy than big heavy. That's correct. That is definitely correct. And and I mean, I agree with everything that you stated. This 
is a team and as well as a draft that's guard and perimeter heavy. So I don't necessarily think with the pieces that the Liberty, the Liberty, excuse me, have right now that they'll be adding another wing player or, or guard to this roster. I do think that they'll be looking for someone that has that size, that has that presence. I know there is a, a name at the top of um, a lot of people's list that they're wishing. Um, she's currently a junior, um, doing amazing things this season. Um, a lot of people are hoping that Charlie Collier is going to come out early from Texas. And if she does, she brings rebounding, she brings scoring, she brings athleticism, um, quickness, and um, her defense is amazing as well. I do think that is a player who will be deservingly um, a top consideration for the uh, number one pick. Yeah, and, and that's the interesting aspect. If she doesn't declare... I'm curious what GM Jonathan Cope does because a lot of times you sit there and you go, okay, what, like, it, do we do the best player possibly in the draft or do we go for somebody who we need fitting this style? When I look at the Liberty, I could see them truly going in either direction. And the reason I say that is, and this is similar for the number two team, the Wings, both these teams are years away from championship contention. So at this point, I don't think. It's the situation where, oh, if we add that right big, we can start talking about championship contention. Maybe they're pushing to the playoffs next year. Maybe. I think the Dallas Wings are definitely pushing for the playoffs next year. Maybe the Liberty are. My thought is, and, and you obviously are going to be much wiser on this than I, when you look at, let's, let's assume Collier's not in the draft. When you look at kind of the players that, you know, pop up to your head. I know it's still early in the college season. It started, you know, a few days ago. I think there, most teams have played two to three games at best if you didn't have COVID issues. But is there a huge discrepancy or is it a situation where you think that, you know what, they might just say this player is you know, like, I, I'm just curious, is there a huge discrepancy through the players or do you find it like a tight grouping at the top? It's, 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 it's tight. Um, and, and I say that because there are no, as of right now, there are, there are a, a group of players who I consider the stars of this particular draft. Not saying that they are, you know, a few years ago, um, you had, you know, you had your diamonds, your Asians, you had, um, and then the next year, of course, you had Enrique, and then you had Sabrina and Satu, and everyone knew who was going to go to the top. I feel like there are a lot of players in this particular draft that at any given moment, depending on who decides to stay or who decides to come out early or come out on time, any of them are capable because of the offerings in this particular draft of going number one. And I do think that if Charlie doesn't come out earlier, the Liberty will probably have to go either you know, maybe trade their pick for a veteran post player, or they'll just draft the best available player. The situation the Liberty are in, I kind of think back to the Las Vegas Aces when they drafted Jackie Young, where, you know, some people were saying she was far and ahead the number one pick. Some people were saying it was a tighter grouping. The Aces, at least in description of why they went with her, was we don't think necessarily, you know, that she was far and ahead the number one pick of this draft. Not to knock her, what we saw in her, and this is their wording, what we saw in her was that she was going to be able to deliver to our team what our team needed. And so a lot of people, you know, it's it's definitely way too early to be calling her a bust at the number one pick. But I think a lot of people in historically, when you look at the WNBA drafts, I mean, just looking at the rookies of the year, there's some amazing players who come in and there's some amazing players who go number one, just looking of recent. So when you look at the, I think Jackie Young is kind of a, uh, uh, a symbol of what we might see in this draft from the New York Liberty. I can if see you that. have any final thoughts on the Liberty, let me know, but I kind of want to move on to the wings. No, I, I definitely agree. I can see that. All right, let's move on to the wings. In my opinion, what do they need? Well, to me, it comes down to health. I read a great article uh, from, from Bendel on his, uh, his, whatever they call it. I'm a boomer when it comes to this stuff on his newsletter, but <laughs> he was talking about health in this team. And I think that truly is the question mark when it comes to what the wings want to do. Because you look at this roster, and if you ask me, this team has the most promising youth movement in the league. And it, a lot of that comes from what they were able to do in last year's draft and the year before that getting a recap. And heck, I know you're a big fan of Alicia Gray. Shout out to Alicia Gray. She's a player who went there also. So when I'm looking at this team, a lot of it really comes down to what do they know about the health of their bigs and the health of Mariah Jefferson? Because Isabel Harrison left with an injury from the bubble, the wobble. 
Uh, Mariah Jefferson, also similar situation. A student to do, excuse me if I mispronounce her name, my apologies, uh, but I get everyone's name wrong. So I don't think, you know, it's anything different with her and anyone else. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, for me looking at that, I kind of go, hmm, I don't really expect them. I mean, they they have some great youth and they have, you know, youth in the bigs. They have youth in the smalls or the guards, whatever you want to call it. So for me, I kind of look at it and I go, that's the outlier. What is going to happen with Mo Jeff and Izzy? Because those are kind of going to decide whether it's what the team thinks about them or what their health dictates. That's going to, in my opinion, decide what the wings do when it comes to this position. What's your thoughts on the wings? I I do feel like um, health plays a big part, um, especially uh, towards the end of the season. I do think their playoff opportunity, you know, it just slightly uh, – drifted away from their grass is um that was because of them not being healthy you know missing quite a few key players Satu and Alicia and others and so they're going to either need that that big or that point guard because you know if Mariah is not you know 100% healthy right now their point guard um options are Marina Mabry and Taisha Harris now hey hey put respect on Harris's name definitely Definitely <laughs> respect on Ty's name. She is, I, she's, I, you know what? Everyone who knows me, they know what I want to say, but I'm not even going to have to say it. But uh, yeah, definitely put respect on Ty's name. It's going to be interesting to see exactly what the vision is of this team, especially with um their, uh, their new coach coming in. And so being able to learn from someone who was a great point guard herself, I think that that could, you know, possibly lead them to select the guard or that actual that big who can get in there and really defend and allow the others to be able to stretch the floor better. And honestly, like looking at the wings, a crazy thing is I don't even think that they need to build through the draft because they don't, excuse me, th- th- right? Like they have so much depth in the bigs that, sorry, in the youth, um, that part of me is like, it's m- kind of more important with what vet, like the success of this team is going to be much more dictated with y- the growth of these youngins, but also what the vets can bring to this team. Mm-hmm. Are we going to see the ability for, you know, some good vets to step in there and really show off? Because often, you know, you can have a roster full of the, some of the best talented young players in the league, but they don't have that experience. They don't have the no to that you gain by just being in the league for longer. So I I almost feel like, okay, you know, it's it's the spoils of war for the Wings because they have just accrued so many draft picks over the past few years and going into the next few years. I'm excited to see what they do. I could honestly see them just saying, you know what, we take the best player possible because at the end of the day, you know, if they get the big who's there and they think that big really fits them, or as we were talking about, it's a much more perimeter heavy draft. If they go in that direction, you know, whether or not you see Ty as your starter or your backup point guard, I think she's she's got starter written all over her, the way that she's able to lead the team and, and work with that team. But I don't think you're going the wrong direction, especially if you have questions about Mo Jeff's health. Correct. I, and I, they have a big decision. They have a lot of decisions to make, actually, because, you know, like you mentioned, they've accumulated so many draft picks. They drafted three this uh, past season, kept all three, and so, like, it's now, and then, of course, they have the free agent um, discussions and decisions to make. Who's going to be on the roster next year? I think mm-hmm. whoever's going to be on their roster will determine or help make that decision for them with what angle or what uh, direction they head in, in, when it comes to the draft. And and the thing that I'm going to be interested in is, is how the new coach plays into this. Now, we know news broke that uh, from Chantel Jennings over at The Athletic. Shout out to her. Uh, breaking news that Vicky Johnson, the former San Antonio Stars head coach, who was then in essence demoted when they moved over to Las Vegas as an assistant coach, now the Las Vegas Aces, has agreed or, you know, her news is that she is taking the job. ESPN with Michelle Vopel, another great reporter, one of the goats of WNBA reporting, reported that uh, she has, I'm I'm blanking on the exact quote, but uh, basically agreed to the principal idea of the agreement, but not fully agreed to it yet. So I'm excited and I hope that it follows through. You can read my tweets on my thoughts on that later. And I'm sure during the off season, we'll continue to dive into that. But for me, it's also like looking at this build, I understand that the GM Greg Bibb is still in charge um, and that's not here nor there. What I'm thinking about though is, 
how he kind of built that roster. He brought in a lot of players that had had a little bit of playing time, a little bit of showtime on the Las Vegas, or sorry, the LA roster when Brian Agler was a coach there. And he brought them over to Dallas. So I'm curious, are those players, you know, were they more of a fit to Agler's system or what the wing system was and what they wanted to do? I do feel like uh, the makeup of the wings uh, will look a lot different. And I feel like the rotations are going to look a lot different um, now that, you know, the new coach will have the opportunity to implement their system. And, you know, what's interesting or what I'm looking to see, you know, who comes back, who, you know, is probably packaged and shipped elsewhere to other teams that could be looking to fill some void. Um, If this new coach will have some sort of say in like, okay, who gets to stay in, you know, what, they're going to need, you know, in order to run their team. I, first of all, not to like talk about Agler too much, but I remember talking to him. He's a coach who at times was the GM, at times wasn't the GM, saw success at both both situations. And I remember talking to him about it and he gave me some wise, uh, some wise words where he said, look, at the end of the day, being the GM, you're doing more work. But all that really matters is that you're on the same page as the GM, that you see the same vision, that you can work together. Because at the end of the day, it's basically a three-legged race because either either you're the other person with the, you know what I mean, or you're doing it with another person. So it's going to be exciting to see kind of what goes on with that. Looking at the third pick in this draft, the Atlanta Dream, what do they need? In my opinion, they need a big that can stretch the floor. They have so many young dynamic scorers with their guards but the bigs are basically the same style. Good defenders, good rebounders, but don't have crazy size and can't shoot the three. And if you ask me, which it's our podcast, so you're asking me, you're listening to it. They need a big who can stretch the floor. I know that they talked about getting Glory Johnson to do that, but it just didn't show up this past season. And the real question for me, and I know a lot of people have talked about this, if you're in the know with the Atlanta Dream, is E. Williams and Mo Billings, like they're just too much of the same in my opinion and so we need to see I don't know if it's and and I know this isn't a a big heavy draft so it kind of sucks for them so I wouldn't be shocked to see them trade down in this maybe for a a pick in next year's draft but what do you see in the Atlanta dream and what do they need a big definitely a big I mean with the dream and then shout out to Atlanta of course you know that's the hometown um well the current hometown but looking at the roster um if they're able to to bring back the guards, so you have those pieces, you know, of course, obviously there's still Hayes, um, you know, to be back next season. You still have, you know, if they're able to resign um, Laney and then throw that in, of course, with Kennedy and, and Courtney Williams. I really thought that Glory was going to be that piece. But of course, you know, quarantine, a lot of people weren't able to really get their their wind underneath them or um, have their legs underneath them this past season. And will they decide to give her another chance or, um, you know, have her back to see what she's able to do, if she's able to do some of those few things, those same things that she was able to do in Dallas a few seasons ago. I know um, towards the end of the season in the presser with Coach Collin, there her statement was basically Kalani. You know, we need we, we traded for Kalani and we need her to be in shape to be the post player that we need. So if Kalani is able to come back in a different shape, um, game shape for next season, I do think that they could possibly um, get another big, a big that can stretch. And then that kind of creates another issue because they still have Brittany Brewer. They have some players out there like Kobe, um, Kobe Thornton from Clemson, who was drafted last year, and they still have the rights to her. What happens with Elizabeth Williams and and Monique Billings? So that is an issue. It's kind of a fun issue to have. Like, okay, which big complements our system and our style better? But I do think that they'll probably be looking for a big or at least some sort of stretch wing type player that could really um, complement. I completely agree with you. And, and I apologize for not bringing up Kalani. And I completely agree with that statement from head coach Nikki. I mean, at the end of the day, like – Let's be factual about it as if we were talking about any other professional sports league. Kalani Brown was not in game shape. Now, whether that had to do with off-season training regimen, having, uh, I believe she had COVID, or at least she was in quarantine for a while. And in general, I mean, that whole Atlanta Dream Team, I know a lot of people were like questioning Nikki and is she on the hot seat or whatever. And I kind of just scoffed at that because, in my opinion, 
that team especially had so many players coming late to the show and then when they mm-hmm. and then players who did arrive but then had to go into quarantine due to covid that mm-hmm. you didn't get to see until late in the season when players like look Courtney Williams a player who is known for her energy and her swag and her drip and and just buckets we didn't see Courtney Williams until like the last couple games of the season when we started to really see who she was and 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 similarly for some of these other players so I agree with you. It's going to be it's going to be really interesting. The question that I have is can Kalani Brown run even if she's in game shape? Can she keep up with the speed that we're going to see from the Kennedy Carter, uh from the Courtney Williams and from the Laney? I mean, oh, and 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 Hayes and if Renee Montgomery comes back, like there's a lot of quick small players uh, she can stretch the ball, but can she keep up with this team? Is going to be an interesting aspect for me. Let's move on to the Indiana Fever. Honestly, when I think about this team and I think about what they're going to do in the draft, I think of what does this team think of McCowan? We saw last year when they went into it, they they into the draft, they wanted to pair her with Cox. That was obvious. Well, we didn't see a lot of, of Cox this season, and honestly, we didn't even see that much of McCowan. So for me, looking at this team, I I almost say that they for the the more than any other team are in the in the book of take whoever is best available because the one in the two, the point guard and the shooting guard, I don't expect much to move there. We saw some great stuff from Julie Alamon. We know what Mitchell can be. They've got some other players who can really score and add aspects to this team. But the real question for me is, okay, do they want a wing or how confident are they in this game style, in this gameplay between Cox and McCowan? What are your thoughts? I feel like the it's, it's so interesting when it comes to the fever because they have some great they have some some really nice pieces. They they have their point guard. I mean, of course, Wheeler, you know, is expected to be back. You know, you have Julie Alamon. So, you know, you have someone who can both point guards who can go out and get you buckets as well as, you know, dish the ball very well. You have Kelsey Mitchell, uh, Mitchell, excuse me. You have Tiffany Mitchell. I think I do like that they brought in Jantel Lavender. And yeah. so having Lavender gives them another post presence. I think what the fever really need is a gamer. They need they need a little bit of an attitude. And I feel like those type of players can do well because you, you know, I, I do think that the experiment could work next season if healthy with um big uh, with Tierra McCowan and Lauren Cox. I do think that they just need someone that has that swagger. And I feel like in this particular draft, there are quite a few um, wing players or stretch players that have that swagger. And the first one that comes to mind to me, really, that could be in that fourth spot is Renaya Davis from Tennessee. Mm. And she's a player who can, she has, I call her a rainbow shot somewhat. Like her threes are like in the rafters <laughs> and they go in. That's all that matter. They go in. Like, she's a gamer. She, she's physical. She's athletic. She's 6'2", but she can play bigger than what she is. So you have someone that has that opportunity to play multiple positions. She's capable of being a point guard as well, but she's a scorer, and she's not afraid to attack the basket. And I do think that someone that could work well um, for for um, for Indiana, think of a, a taller Victoria Vivens almost. Mm. Um, so in terms of they can score in volume, um, definitely larger body, um, larger size, but I do think that Renaya can bring that attitude there. And if she, if she were to fall to the fourth spot. Well, and, and that's an interesting aspect. I'm glad you brought up Victoria Vivian's because for me, when I look at this roster, I think in, in, I, I ch- always try and think of like, if everybody's super healthy, if Victoria Vivian's doesn't have these past two seasons of injury plague. I think it's very different what the Fever are looking. I mean, they might still be looking for a wing just to add depth, but what we saw from Vivian's in a rookie season was the compliment to Mitchell that we wanted, to Kelsey Mitchell, excuse me, because there's two of them. Um, and and honestly, like this team at its best, like let's not forget, this team played a great game. Well, I, and, and I'm going to get shade from the Indiana Fever fans, but this team played one great game and kicked the butt of the Seattle Storm. And they're, in my opinion, throughout the whole season, we're by far the best team. Don't talk to me about final record. Don't talk to me about the fact that Las Vegas Aces end up getting the number one seed. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, 
Victoria Vivians is kind of the person who I look at it and I go, okay, well, you know, if she's healthy, that's a big if. And because that's a big if, I feel like that's where they got to be looking. And and I like you and I appreciate you for bringing up some players that might fit into that. Um, uh, any, any any other thoughts on any of these teams that we might be shocked? I, uh, is there any of these teams that you would be like blown away if they traded out of the top four? Because honestly, in this draft, I would not be shocked to see a team trade out of the top four to build some stock into next year's draft. The one who I feel like could trade out if they were to trade out, it would probably be three and four. Mm -hmm. Um, Atlanta, because of the pieces that they have, if anything, I I feel like Atlanta has their their core of guards. Mm -hmm. Like think of once again Kennedy Carter. If Renee Montgomery comes back, um, she, uh, you have Tiffany Hayes. Yeah, if they're able to resign Benaj Laney, you have like a core of your guards right there. Add some more stretch players and a, probably a post player. Can they find that in a trade? Um, can they find either of those options in the trade? In the same with Dallas, are they really comfortable? With, uh, I mean, excuse me, um, Indiana, uh, are they comfortable with what they have right now or would they like to trade out? So I think it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, with free agency, anything could happen. Dallas, um, Dallas could even move out. So to be honest, I think everyone could possibly trade out except for New York. Yeah, I mean, that that's the beauty of a what some are calling a not deep draft. But I feel like every year everyone talks about the not deep draft and then it goes on. Any final thoughts on these lottery teams? Um, I do feel like there are some players who you can't pass up on while they may not be the deepest draft. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some players that if you had the opportunity to take them, I think you would. And um, right away, my the top players who I'm just thinking of who you can't pass up on if she comes out early that's charlie collier and if she comes out i think new york is definitely going to take her and then one of the most electrifying point guards um you have dana evans and Ari mcdonald so either both of them those are some players who you can definitely take and go no i I think that's it so those are my final thoughts on those lottery teams i'm looking forward to seeing we have about what four more months before we know exactly who's taking where well, I mean, that's if you're not an ins- No. <laughs> yeah, no, it'll, it'll be an exciting time. And and this is the time where, you know, the talking heads get going. We, we Mock drafts are going to be coming out. I know you're working on one. I know Ben Dull's working on one. I know some other people on different outlets are working on some. Um, I'm excited to see what the talking heads say and then the fans debating it and getting on the pod with you many more times before the season starts and, and talking about these things because, you know, you're my NCAA guru. As we always say, Winsider is your one-stop shop for WNBA news and conversation, but we can't do it without your help. Become a subscriber at patreon.com backslash Winsider for just a few dollars a month. You can directly help grow the game.